hey, I, uh, I want to introduce to you my family. Everywhere I go, I try to introduce my family. So let me introduce my wife, Elizabeth. This is my wife, Elizabeth, of 31 years. This year will be 32 years to the glory of God. And uh, I asked her out when she was 12. And I was 14 years old. And obviously we didn't date, but it was kid stuff. But uh, I waited until she was 17 and I was 19. I had my eyes on her, glory to God. And Elizabeth is a great leader, a worship leader in Chicago. And God has used her in women's ministry and so forth. Elizabeth and I, we pastored a church in Chicago for close to 20 years. We have three beautiful children. Let me show you my tribe. This is my tribe. We've got two girls and a boy. They're all married and they're out of the house. Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> I'm shooting out these arrows from the quiver. They got to go. They got to go. I'm not this Hispanic father that wants their kids to stay with them. No, you got to go in Jesus' name. <laughs> I want my girlfriend back. Amen. And so Elizabeth and I, we are also grandparents. And uh, what a joy. Listen to me. What a joy to be grandparents. I don't know why God did not give us the grandchildren first and then keep the kids in Jesus' name. But we have, let me show you my first granddaughter. This is Charlie Grace. Charlie Grace. So my mother, she's Puerto Rican. She's 80 years old. I go to her. I said, Mommy, uh, uh, I got my first granddaughter. And she says, what's her name? I said, her name is Charlie. And my mother, she's like, Charlie? Isn't that a boy's name? I said, Mommy, this culture today, you know, they use names. It goes back and forth. Don't, don't worry about it. So this is Charlie Grace. Then my second granddaughter was born, Reagan. This is Reagan Liv. So I go, I go to my mom. I said, Mommy, I got my second granddaughter. And she says, what's her name? I said, Reagan. She says, Reagan? Isn't that a president's name? I said, Mommy, move on, move on, move on. And so this is, uh, we've got two girls and two boys. Let me show you James Anthony. This is James Anthony. And uh, he's now around seven months old. I got to update my pictures. Yeah. And then let me show you Donovan. Donovan, who is a few months. Now, Donovan and Reagan, they're brother and sisters. They have blue eyes and they're white. So I told my wife, I said, babe, I can't take these kids to the store, <laughs> to the mall. They'll be like, arrest him, arrest him. And so we are grateful. My wife and I, we're living in the more of the Lord. Well, I've come to give you a word of the Lord. I've come to provoke you. Uh, River Valley, I've come to disturb your spirit. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians, if you have your Bibles, open with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Would you do that? Ephesians chapter 6. I want to talk to you what's been burning in my heart. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 17. Finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your husband, your wife, they're not your enemy. Your children, they're not your enemy. Paul tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand. Stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I'm from Chicago. I love the Cubs. I love the Bears. I know that you here in Minnesota, uh, you have your team. But I don't know who invented the DVR, but praise the Lord who invented the DVR. Because when I'm in church preaching in the weekend, I will put on the DVR if the Cubs are playing or the Bears are playing, I will put on the DVR. And by the time I leave church, I've already have known that either they won or lost. 
and then I get home. And if they won, I'm going to see the game. Watch this. There is something powerful about having full knowledge. Are you with me? There's something powerful about having full knowledge of what's going to happen because I know the end result. So even if they score 10 runs against the Cubs in the third inning, I have no problem eating my rice and beans and my pork chop because I know, I know the end result. If I watch the Bears, and pray for us, but when I watch the Bears and, and there's a fumble or there's an interception, I, it doesn't interrupt me because I have full knowledge of what's going to happen in this game. It doesn't impact me because I have pre-knowledge. And we know, church, we know that at the end of the book, we win. Come on, somebody get excited. We win. We know that the son turns it over to the father. The book of Ephesians, if you're taking notes, it's a book of ecclesiology in nature. Ephesians wants to talk to you about the church, the church of Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you here something? We cannot allow Hollywood to define who we are. The Bible tells you who you are. You're a child of the living king. But the problem in America, in my opinion, is that the church is being told. Watch this. In the book of Ephesians, they're talking about the church. We read in chapter 6 that at the end of the book of Ephesians, he says, therefore, in order to wrap it up, the apostle Paul wants to warn God's people. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's you. He wants to warn you. And he wants to give you a perspective for living in a pagan nation like Ephesus. Three times, y'all, three times, he says, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Which translates, don't move. Stay right where you're at. The problem is, is that we are people of God. We're trying to understand God. And God doesn't ask you to understand him. He's asking that we obey him because understanding can wait, church, but obedience cannot. Understanding can wait, but obedience cannot. And Paul is talking about the church. We're the greatest, look at me, we're the greatest institution on planet earth. A scared world needs a fearless church. When I put this here, I thought for sure a lot of people get crazy with that. I say, yes. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says this. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, been a blessed, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with very spiritual blessings in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. He exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of, of evil in the heavenly realms. What are you saying, Pastor Choco? There's something going on in the heavenly realms. Something is happening. And Paul says that God has given you the tools for that realm in order to deal with the, and operate in the earthly realm. Let me say that again. Paul says that God has given you all the tools from that realm in order to deal and operate here in Minnesota. He's giving you. The problem I think that many of us were having an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. I remember. I remember when I went to Burkina Faso, Africa, and they took me and they said, Pastor Choco, we want to take you to the palace. We want you to meet the Mordecai king. I said, let's do it. 
Love to meet the Mordecai king. And as we get to the palace, they stop and say, now listen, there's protocol when you meet the king. I said, give it to me. What's the protocol? He says, there's going to be three chairs. One for you, one for the translator, and the king's chair. Whatever you do, Pastor Choco, don't look at the king. I said, hey, <laughs> you all you have to tell me is once. I don't want drama here in Burkina Faso, Africa. I want to go back home to my wife Elizabeth. Just tell me once. So there I am. Watch this. I come in and they sit me in my chair. And at the corner of my eye, I can see the king's chair. And then when I sit down, the translator comes in. And he sits down before me. And we're looking at each other. And then there's music. Which tells me that the king is coming. Because when I came, there was no music. The <laughs> devil is a liar. At least give me some salsa or something. Give me some merengue. So I, I sit down. I sit down, and, I, and the music, and there's the king. And I can see him from the corner of my eye, y'all. He was dressed in white with gold trimming of the Mode tribe. And he comes, and he sits at his chair. And I can see him from the corner of my eye. And when he sits down, I look to the translator. And I said, tell your king that I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. And I represent the king of kings and the lord of lords. He said to me, you want me to tell him what? <laughs> I said, tell your king that I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. And I represent the king of kings and the lord of lords. He turned towards the king. And in his Mori tribe language, he starts saying, Pastor Choco said <laughs> that he's an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. And that he represents the king of kings and the lord of lords. And I could see from the corner of my eye. And what the king does breaks protocol. Listen, y'all, he breaks protocol. I can see the king, he gets up from his chair and he, waits, he makes his way towards me. And I'm like, oh man, I'm dead. <laughs> I just offended the king in his own palace. And he walks towards me and he gets closer. I can see him from the corner of my eye. And when he gets to me, he puts his hand on my shoulder and in pure English says, can you pray for me in Jesus' name? There cannot be an identity crisis. You need to know your father is the king. You need to know that you and I have power in the heavenly realms. And we have been given a tool to operate. And one of the tools is authority. We need to walk like it. We need to talk like it. We don't talk like that anymore. Thus saith the Lord. Paul he divides the armor into two categories of three. Let's break it up for you right now. First category, he says, to be, so that you may be able to stand. And here are the three. So that you may be able to stand, belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, choose fit it with the readiness that comes with the gospel. That's the first category. It's a state of being. River Valley, it's a state of being in the 21st century, in the year 2020, that you are ready to share the good news. Why do you think God saved you, y'all? Why do you think he take you out of your mess? He, he saved you. He saved me so that we could become proclaimers of the gospel. Not so that we could take a chair for 25 years, 20 years, and do nothing. No, God saves us so that we can be at a state of being ready to share the good news of the gospel. The second category is to take. So you have to be and you have now to take. Take the shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of the spirit. Take. Now, in baseball, if a player is in the bench and he grabs the bat, it's a good indication to me that the, my brother is not going to play you know, defense. He's about to bat. The bat is an indicator what he's going to do. Would you agree with that? Yeah. It's an indicator. When he grabs his glove and he runs out into the field, it's an indicator what he's going to do. He is to be ready and he's ready to take a position. For what? Pastor Choco, what? Why? Because the days are evil. The evil days. And we need to express our authority 
here on earth. When you and I are in a battle, we don't need a theory. We need something practical. Something that we can use right now. And Paul gets practical and tells them what to put on. Listen to me. If you're going through a hard time right now in 2020, if you've only been for a few months now, if, if you're going through a hard time, you need to put on. You need to be ready. Because there are evil days. For example, the belt of truth, truth is not a feeling. Truth is more than just facts. Watch this. As a matter of fact, it's not the truth that sets you free. No. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's a difference between truth setting you free and knowing the truth. Are you with me? You will know the truth, the Bible says in John 8, 32, and the truth will set you free. Did you know that the Emancipation of Proclamation was signed on January 1863? January 1863. But the slaves down Texas did not hear about their freedom until June 19, 1865. A year and a half later, the truth was already made. That they were set free, but they did not know. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, how will they know? Unless someone goes. Unless you go. Because we're the church. And the church of Jesus Christ is a church that will begin to bring transformation and truth. Can I just say here that the devil wants you to stay ignorant. To stay in bondage. He's fine in 2020 that you just, just be good. But don't, don't start looking for God's presence. Don't, don't, don't go raising your hand. Don't, don't do that. Just, just go to church and be good. The, the, the enemy wants you to stay ignorant and in bondage. June 1944. After a 24-hour delay. Many of you know this story. June after 24-hour weather delay, the largest military operation in history of warfare was about to begin. Preceded by the aerial bombardment of coastal defense and 13,000 paratroopers dropped behind enemy lines. 5,000 ships, 156,000 soldiers are about to storm the beaches of Normandy, France. But you and I know it as D-Day has arrived. And just before the invasion of Normandy, General Eisenhower issued a now famous letter to the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, the Allied forces. And in it, he let them know that they were about to embark upon the great crusade to bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of the Nazis over the oppressed people of Europe and the security for ourselves in a free world. And instilling confidence in the invasion force, General Eisenhower did not in any way suggest that the task would be easy or that the enemy would be defeated quickly. He says, I quote, your task would not be easy. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, battle-hardened, and he will fight savagely. Paul is saying in Ephesians, River Valley, make sure you are prepared. Make sure you have your shoes on. Make sure you're ready to share the good news. Why? Because you're grateful. You're grateful for what God has done in your life. I tell, I tell the people in Chicago that gratefulness is the key to heaven's door. That when you and I are just grateful for the church, grateful for our pastor, grateful for the ministry here, just grateful. Thank you, Lord. A grateful life is one who's ready to share the good news of the gospel. A grateful heart is proclaiming heart. It is one who's easily and readily proclaims the gospel because you want everyone to have what you have. Watch this, watch this. 
The problem with the church today is that we are, don't know where we're playing in this field. For instance, in the NFL, in the NFL, you know that there's three teams, right? You say, well, Pastor Choco, no, there's only two teams. No, there's three. You have the defense and the offense. And the offense is trying to get this ball, and this defense is trying to stop them and killing them and tackling them, and they're fighting there. That's the two teams. That's the most obvious. But there's another team. They're called referees. Did you know there are nine referees on the field? And they're dressed in black and white. They don't look like either of the team. Did you know that the referees have a playbook that has been sanctioned by New York? That the referees, they learn the playbook, and when they see something wrong, they throw a flag. Unnecessary roughness. You can't do that. Delay of game. You've seen it. They're throwing their flags, the red flags, the white flags, the yellow flags. Their job is to legislate the law. Their job is to legislate the book. It's not their job to pick a team. Because the moment you pick a team, you have weakened your voice to legislate the good news. That's why I tell people, I say, hey, we're neither the donkey or the elephant. We represent the lion from the tribe of Judah. That's who we are. And when we look at the playing field, and we look at the playing field, we pick a team. You have now lost your voice, your prophetic voice on planet Earth. You are an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. Your job and my job is to put on the full armor, to take the helmet, and be ready for whatever comes Whatever comes your way. Because the days, look at me, look at me. The days are evil. They're evil days. We must go out. In Matthew chapter 28, we know it as the Great Commission. It's called the Great Commission. It's not the Great Suggestion. To go out. See, I wasn't raised in the Assemblies of God Church. I was not raised in the church. I was raised in the hood of Chicago. And so when I became the pastor in Chicago, I knew that this gospel had to be outside of the four walls. And that we had to take people out there and tell them about the good news. To put on our shoes and our helmet and our breastplate and let's go out and empty hell and fill heaven to the glory of God. But we as a church need to know that God has called us to stand in the gap for a dying generation. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, for I look for a man among them who will stand in the gap, and I found no one. I didn't find a man, I didn't find a woman who had the audacity to stand to invade hell. See, when you live in Chicago, you have, no other, you have no other choice but to fight. I mean, we're surrounded by gangs. And, you know, I remember when I started growing up, and I wasn't a pastor then, and the gangs would stop me, and they would stop me and say, what'd you be about? In other words, what, what's your affiliation gang? And I said, I'd be about Jesus. What'd you be about? And they would tell me their gang sign. And I would shake their hand. I said, cool, you'd be about that, I'd be about Jesus. You're going to have to represent your father. When I got saved at 14, I'm all in. There is no ambiguity about my relationship with my father. Let me, let me close this up for you. We were in Chicago. And a, a, we were passing out Bibles out in the streets, New Testaments. And as a, as a student walked into his classroom, the teacher grabbed the Bible and threw it in the garbage and said to the entire class, this Bible is good for nothing. And he threw it in the garbage. True. It's not CNN. It's not, it doesn't come out on MSNBC, Fox News. He threw it in the garbage. What he did not know is that there was a student who went to my church 
who texts his father, Bob, you would not believe what I just saw. The father texts me, Pastor Choco, you would not believe what I just heard. And I did what any pastor would do. I got in my car and I headed towards the school. <laughs> now the principal knows me because we, as a church, we've adopted 15 schools. Over 6,000 6, children will get free book bags, free immunization, free haircut, all sponsored by the church. And, and, you know, what I was doing throughout the years was building credit. And I'm about to cash in some of my credit. And I walked into the school and she says, Reverend DeJesus, how you doing? I said, not good. One of your teachers threw the Bible in the garbage. Go get him. I want to talk to him. She leaves. Listen, it went something like this. She leaves her office and I said a prayer. It wasn't a spiritual prayer, but it was a prayer. <laughs> I said something like this. I said, God... Oh, God, I pray that it was a math book. I pray that it was a science book. But if it's the Bible that he threw in the garbage, I'm going to kill him. In Jesus' name. You got to end it in Jesus' name. So she comes back with this tall uh, Anglo or atheist and walks in. And I, my name is Reverend DeJesus. What's your name? He sits down and I said, is it true that you threw the Bible in the garbage? And he said, yes, I did. Wow, man. My Puerto Rican blood. <laughs> How dare you? For thousands of years, people have died for a verse. People have crossed rivers, climbed mountains just to get a Bible. You don't have the authority to insult the faith of these young people in your class. You will go back and you will repent. You look, I'm a pastor because we believe in repentance. And you will repent today. And you, principal, get on the intercom and tell all the teachers in the school to respect the Bible. Attention, faculty. <laughs> then I went with the teacher to the classroom. He took the Bible out of the garbage and asked for forgiveness. But where is that man? Where is that woman today that believes that we're the greatest institution on planet Earth? You put on the full armor of God. Would you stand with me for a moment? Would you stand with me? All over the campuses, I want to pray for you right now. That you would be a man and a woman of God who will represent the church unapologetically. With love and truth. That you will represent the church of Jesus Christ. Because your father is the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now. And we pray that as we ponder these thoughts through this week, that we will make a difference in our communities, in our cities, in our families. Help us to be a light in the salt of the earth. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. God bless you.